once joked to a friend that I was going to rename the law firm Pedophiles Are Us. If Bill Barr wants to be the president's personal lawyer, he ought to take that position, not be attorney general for the United States. Do you want to touch the trophy? See what it feels like to be a winner? The Pentagon estimates 20,500 service members were sexually assaulted last year, a 38% jump from two years ago. According to the report, women between the ages of 17 and 24 are at the highest risk of being sexually assaulted by their peers. Only one in three service members who were assaulted chose to report it. And of the nearly 4,800 women who did, around 21% say they experienced retaliation. President Trump is 0 for 2 in his recent attempts to make the Fed great again. In mid-April, sexual harassment allegations tanked Herman Cain's nomination. And today, Trumponomics author Stephen Moore said he was bowing out too because of, quote, unrelenting attacks on his character. But it was Moore's attacks on gender equality that did him in. He spent recent days defending his more toxic comments, including this one from 2000. The, the male needs to be the, the breadwinner of the family. The 21st Democrat has entered the race for president, Colorado Senator Michael Bennett. He's not the first senator and not the first candidate from Colorado, and he may not even make it to the debates. The Democratic National Committee says it doesn't have plans to let more than 20 candidates walk onto the stage in June. Facebook has permanently banned Alex Jones, his InfoWars accounts, the Nation of Islam leader, and other far-right personalities from its platform and Instagram. Facebook says its review of the accounts was, quote, extensive, which goes some way to explaining why the company was so slow to act. Most of the people banned today were kicked off Twitter last year. I came to meet Michael Jensen through the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I was contacted by Michael's mother. At church, she approached me and said that she heard that I had been looking for a babysitter for my kids. She approached me saying that if my ex-husband and I ever wanted to get away, that Michael would be a great babysitter. I was um, getting ready to put my youngest son, who was four at the time, on the bus. He started crying. And he said, I don't want Michael to babysit for us again. He says to me, Mom, he makes me suck his privates. And the world just sort of stopped. It's rainy. Helen belongs to the small group of people who say they've had their lives shattered twice. First by the sexual abuse of a child, and again by the role of their church in the abuse. So that's actually my house right there, my old house. So how long did you live in this neighborhood? About seven years. Still, still looks the same. The trees are just a little bit bigger. Helen converted to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as a teenager. She says it was like getting an instant extended family. When my oldest was born, he had special needs. The support I got from the church, it was a lifesaver. You sort of become so integrated with everybody. You, you have Sunday worship service, you have weekend activities, you have during the week activities for your children or for young women's or Relief Society. So even if you're kind of spread out a little bit, everybody knows everybody. That intimacy is by design. Mormon congregations are divided into wards of just a few hundred members. At the head of each ward is a bishop. Bishops aren't professional clergy. They're laymen with day jobs. But they act as a father figure, and worshipers are encouraged to seek counsel from them on everything from marriage trouble to financial help. Mormons also believe bishops have a spiritual gift known as the power of discernment. It allows them to divine when someone's telling the truth. When she learned Michael Jensen was sexually abusing their four-year-old son, Helen says she and her husband went to Bishop Don Fischel. His response to it was, I will, I will talk to Michael, I will talk to his mom, I'll talk to his parents, I'll figure out what's going on. What happened next is in dispute and played out in a civil lawsuit brought by the parents against the church. Fischel testified that he never met with Helen, only her husband. 
and says he was never specifically told there was a sexual assault, just that something happened between Jensen and the boy. Fischl testified that he then visited Michael Jensen and that Jensen claimed that the boy may have walked in on him while he was watching pornography and was upset by the graphic images. Fischl said that he prayed for guidance and discerned that Jensen was being truthful. He said to me, I did speak with Michael, and he looks at me, he looks me dead in the face, and he says, I know this didn't happen. Michael is a good kid from a good family, and I know this didn't happen. Fischl denies that a conversation with Helen ever took place. Sex abuse is a problem in institutions across American society, from the Catholic Church to the military to Hollywood. But each of those institutions has been revealed to have its own particular culture that lets perpetrators evade accountability and pressures victims to stay silent. It took years for Helen to learn how the church wants bishops to deal with abuse allegations. That even if bishops believe the allegations could be true, their first call isn't to police. Abuse in any form is sinful, tragic, and in total opposition to the teachings of the Savior. This 1999 video was made to promote the church's abuse helpline, which is still very much in existence today. The church says it condemns abuse in any form and takes the matter seriously. The first thing church leaders are told to do is call a helpline. Call the helpline to verify that the reported actions constitute abuse. Call and find out if the law requires it to be reported to civil authorities. After the first wave of Catholic Church abuse scandals, lots of religious organizations opened hotlines. What makes the Latter-day Saints one unique is that it's intended to be used by bishops, not congregants. And court filings show that while calls are answered by an agency known as LDS Family Services, which is staffed by counselors, employees transfer all calls to the church's law firm, Curtin McConkie, based in Salt Lake City. What's your boat's name? Silvana. Okay. It's a village in uh, southern Tuscany. Oh. Tim Kosnoff has gone up it's, against uh, Kurt McConkie in more than 100 cases. Do you want me to kick off my shoes? Or? No, not this time. Kosnoff is one of the lawyers Helen and five other Martinsburg families hired to sue the church for civil damages. When we met him, he was getting ready to retire after a decades-long career suing institutions over sex abuse, including the Boy Scouts and the Catholic Church. I once joked to a friend that I was going to rename the law firm Pedophiles Are Us because that's what we deal with. I've handled 150 of these claims against the Mormon Church. It's very difficult to find law firms that will, will take on the Mormon Church. One of the reasons is the helpline. Instead of calling 911, they're specifically instructed not to do that, but instead to call this 1-800 helpline number, which incidentally rings into the offices of the church's lawyers. It's a helpline for the lawyers, not for the children or anybody else. It gives them an opportunity to get involved quickly, send lawyers out there, talk to victims, silence them if they can. So do you think the LDS Church is able to intimidate people into not suing it because it has such a deep well of resources? Absolutely. The church could drop 35, 40, 50 million dollars in defense costs on their attorneys and advanced costs. That's nothing to them. What is 50 million dollars to a church that takes in 10 billion in tithing and has stockpiled all of this wealth? The pattern in the Mormon Church is to keep this secret uh, deal with it internally as a matter of sin, not as a issue of public safety, but as a moral failing to be dealt with through repentance and prayer. A purported internal document from 2012, which was given to the site Mormon Leaks, offers a glimpse of how Kurt McConkie works. It's a list of abuse allegations from around the world that describes potential legal claims against the church, and in some cases, how much money to offer the victim. Curtin McConkie and the Church of Latter-day Saints denied interview requests for this story. In a written statement, an outside spokesman for the firm said it adheres to standards that are consistent with the practices of law firms and always advises compliance with relevant laws. The church sent an email saying it took appropriate action when it learned of the abuse by Michael Jensen. In regards to abuse cases, the church says it takes steps to encourage reporting and, where available, provides counselors to help victims. 
Bishop Fischel and the Jensen family did not return our calls. What no one told the Martinsburg Ward members was that Michael Jensen already had two prior felony charges for sexual assault in Utah before his family moved there. Jensen was on a Mormon mission in Arizona in 2012 when Spring discovered what he'd done to her sons. I broke down. Nothing really prepares you for that. And so I just completely broke down. And I left, I left the room and just went into the bathroom and just cried. Spring says when her bishop didn't answer, her next call was to the West Virginia State Police. I tried to get in touch with the bishop, but I thank God because he wasn't available. And so the state police, when you look at it from a different viewpoint of it not being a sin and it being a crime, then it needed to be, I needed to put it into their hands. State troopers started an investigation and church officials brought Jensen back from his mission to participate. But they didn't tell anyone in Martinsburg why he'd been called back. And several families allowed Jensen to stay at their homes in the months prior to his arrest in mid-2013. I found out that Michael abused other children during the criminal trial process. During that time, other parents started to come forward and started to tell their story to the state prosecutor. And actually, the person representing Michael, Michael's defense attorney, was a member of the high priesthood. And he was defending Michael. I felt betrayed. I felt betrayed that they would rally around this individual, Michael Jensen, who is a serial pedophile, and they rallied around him. And there was no protection and no support for my children or for any of the other children or for the families. Jensen was convicted of sexually abusing Springs children and is currently serving a sentence of 35 to 75 years in state prison. The judge called him a violent sexual predator. Spring, Helen, and four more Martinsburg families settled a suit with the Mormon church last year. The church denied any wrongdoing. Helen and Spring had to sign non-disclosure agreements. And as usual in these cases, the settlement amount is confidential. You guys are almost ready. Helen lost her job, her marriage, and her religion. She no longer considers herself a Mormon. When you have something like that happen and you have a tragedy, no one person deals with it the same. There was so much pain associated with it and there was so much just heartache with it that I think it, was, it wasn't it was something that I could be a part of anymore. I couldn't be a part of the church anymore. I couldn't, I just couldn't do it anymore. What do you hope happens with the LDS church? I really would like to see some policy change from them. The helpline they have set up now is not, it's not set up to help the victims. It's set up to help the church. You good? You know, the LDS church, they have this primary saying that's uh, CTR, choose the right. Follow that concept. Choose the right thing. What was the right thing to do here? More than 3,000 leading figures from around Afghanistan have convened here in Kabul for a historic meeting to discuss the Trump administration's plans to make peace with the Taliban. The capital is on security lockdown for the event. Schools and government offices are closed. Major roads into the city have been blocked and movement is being heavily restricted after a series of deadly attacks. The centuries-old traditional assembly known as a lawyer jirga happens very rarely at times of national crisis. The last one was in 2013, the one before followed the US invasion. This one is about the US pulling out. Man, Afghan President Ashraf Ghani called the meeting. He's worried his government is being sidelined from the negotiations, with the Taliban still refusing to engage with him directly. The Taliban are boycotting the event completely. They've issued a statement warning Afghans not to attend. And some prominent Afghan figures are sitting it out for another reason, accusing Ghani of using the Jirga as a platform to boost his profile ahead of September elections. Hamid Karzai was president at the very start of the conflict. That's a good, one. That's a good picture of President yeah. Bush. Yes, that's a very nice picture. He told Vice News he won't be attending. 
I told President Ali I should have been called six months ago when the United States announced its peace process, or it should be convened six months from now. When we have reached a point, when we have made some agreements with the Taliban, when we know the contours of the peace process, then we should present it to the Afghan people and get their ratification. The terms of the peace agreements are being discussed right now in Doha, where US envoy Zalmay Khalilzad and Taliban representatives just started the sixth round of talks to bring the 18-year conflict to an end. High on the agenda is a ceasefire. Three American troops were killed last week, and the US military has said it's now stopped tracking how much territory is controlled or influenced by the Taliban. For their part, the Taliban won't consider laying down arms until there's a clear timetable for a full US military withdrawal, a demand unthinkable under previous administrations attempting to bring America's longest war to an end. Did you ever imagine, after your years in office and what this country went through, that the Americans would be sitting down with the Taliban to negotiate a ceasefire? Oh, yes, I did very much, and, and this is what I've been asking uh, almost now for, let's say, I've been asking them since 2006. That was one of my disagreements with the United States government. I told them that you could talk to them. You could bring them on board. They didn't agree with me then. They didn't want a peace process in Afghanistan then. They wanted to fight. Uh, they're doing it 18 years too late, or let's say, 14 years too late. You wouldn't say this is some kind of a defeat for the Americans to, to, to be negotiating? No, it is not. A, a no, military withdrawal? No, it is not. I don't say I, the American people should not feel that it's a defeat for them. The American people have made the right decision to talk to the Taliban and to find their interests in Afghanistan in the region by a compromise with the entire Afghan nation, not by trying to prop up one part of it and go and kill the other part of it. After his grilling by the Senate Judiciary Committee yesterday, Attorney General William Barr was supposed to testify before the House Judiciary Committee today. But he chose to cut class instead. In response, Committee Chair Jerry Nadler threatened to hold Barr in contempt. If he does not provide this committee with the information it demands and the respect it deserves, Mr. Barr's moment of accountability will come soon enough. And Congress isn't done with Barr. Multiple committees have spent the last few years investigating Russian interference into the 2016 election. And they're clamoring for Barr to release the unredacted Mueller report. Mark Warner is the vice chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee. You've put in hundreds of hours of interviews, mostly classified. What goes through your mind? And just how do you feel when you hear Barr testifying or Trump getting out there and saying, I'm exonerated, which doesn't seem to be your takeaway? It's not my takeaway at all. I think it's pretty amazing. Bill Barr, who was supposed to be this guy that was be a defender of, of rule of law, he has completely failed at that test. And, and the fact that the Attorney General didn't even look at any of the underlying evidence that framed a lot of the Mueller report is, I think, irresponsible. And instead, what we've seen is Barr simply trying to, frankly, mimic and echo some of the Trump statements. If Bill Barr wants to be the president's personal lawyer, uh, he ought to take that position, not be Attorney General for the United States. And what do you think today he's boycotting the House hearing that was scheduled? It bothers me that you've had a White House that's constantly undermined the intelligence community, the FBI, the Justice Department, and now you have an attorney general that is doing the same. And in many ways, I never thought I'd say this, uh, but boy, oh boy, Jeff Sessions, at least in terms of his respect for rule of law, looks a heck of a lot better than Bill Barr. Do you think Barr should be held in contempt if he doesn't? Come and testify Barr, in the House? If Barr does not respond to a legitimate request of the House Judiciary Committee, uh, I think it would be very appropriate. Does the report make you want to bring in any witnesses you've already interviewed or bring a new one? Well, I believe there will be cases where people who came to us and frankly lied to us. That's breaking the law. And we're going through all the places where the Mueller report contradicts testimony of sworn witnesses. Uh, and we may have, and I'm 
imagine we will have, um, referrals to the, to the FBI and the Justice Department on those actions. And Bob Mueller needs to come up and testify because I think the one thing that we've seen, listen, I was, I thought Mueller would have potentially gone further. I've, uh, but the one thing about Mueller uh, that I think most folks in this town is they think he's a pretty straight shooter. So let's let him give some explanation, not simply Bill Barr's whitewashing of, of his report. Where should the Mueller report have gone further? Nailing down Roger Stone, a close confidant of Donald Trump, Roger Stone, who was in regular contact with Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, that whole mystery. The other question I think that there's been lots of swirl about was the whole question of whether businessman Donald Trump might have been compromised by the number and volume of Russian money that potentially was money laundered that went into his operation. I think many of us thought that perhaps Mueller was looking at that because of the possibility of having candidate Trump potentially compromised by the Russians. Do you think President Trump obstructed justice? On the obstruction of justice issues, that was not something that our committee has spent a lot of time on. You know, candidly, I'll leave that to the lawyers. And now collusion isn't really a technical term, it's something in the lexicon. Yeah, if, if, we, could, if we could have the record back, I wish we would have not used the term collusion, which is not even a, a legal term. But I gotta just tell you, as an American, if a political campaign is receiving assistance from a foreign power, particularly a foreign power that is viewed as an adversary, and if we've seen evidence that that political campaign and the president's family, his, his kid, Donald Trump Jr., welcomed the dirt that would come from the Russians, if you had the president's campaign manager sharing polling data with a known Russian operative, if that's not illegal, well, it should be on a going forward basis. If you're contacted by foreign agents during a political campaign and they're offering you dirt on the opposition, there ought to be an affirmative obligation to turn that over to law enforcement. Grab these coffee outside, and we'll get started right at nine. Thank you all so right. much. Thank you, Savannah. I'll see you in a we'll few see minutes. See you later. Bye. If all goes according to plan, Savannah Drake will be the future of the Democratic Party. The 22-year-old was going to be a teacher, <laughs> but changed her mind right before graduating. I'll take it. That's when she decided to dabble in politics. So I was a manager for a slate campaign in Arizona for state house and state senate. And that was my first and only like political experience. And so now I'm here to actually learn what a campaign manager is. <laughs> very, very exciting stuff. So. Yeah. 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 The Democratic Party sees an opening in 2020 to capitalize on never Trump fever and win big at every level of government. Uh, Fired up young people like Savannah are the key to making that a reality. But the party is struggling to find and keep qualified campaign staff. It's no real surprise, because classically, it's been one of the world's shittiest jobs. What's wrong with the modern campaign? So campaign culture is, we'll sleep the day after election day. We'll eat after election day. You know, we need to do everything we possibly can in order to get these candidates elected. And then when it's all done, then we can take care of ourselves. Arena Academy is funded by a lot of major Democratic establishment groups. Last month, they hosted their second staff training where they made a big point of trying to teach these political newbies how to win elections without losing their souls. When we haze people, when we keep this culture of pull yourselves up by your bootstraps, you better figure it out, we are not living our values as progressive folks. The win number, the persuasion, that's our stuff. This idea was put to the test when the centerpiece of arena training, a campaign simulation, got underway. Savannah is the campaign manager for Table 10. Their job is to come up with a campaign plan that will beat Steve King in Iowa. The best campaign plan wins the Arena Cup, which is basically bragging rights. Do you want to touch the trophy? See what it feels like to be a winner? Table 10's plan is to get that feeling while also getting a good night's sleep. So I told everyone that they are going to go home by 9, 9 p.m. 9 p.m. That's very bold. What is our path to victory? Why are we being hired? Why are they being fired? There were disagreements. We don't have to worry about that. 
But we do need to worry about this because this is the bigger scale. So, and they're not going to read this if it's on the slideshow. They hoped it would be easy. <laughs> so how is that? Uh, how's Wrong. that nine o'clock deadline? What happened there? It's campaign world. By the clock on the wall, ten thirty-seven. Mm -hmm. You wrapped up. Are you actually done? No, not <laughs> at all. <laughs> Look, Whatever. campaigns, even pretend ones, yeah. are really hard work. And Table 10's fake campaign ended up looking exactly like a real one. So what time did you actually like shut your computers down and stop working last night? Our data person said she worked until 2 a.m. Okay, last all right, night. so now we're talking. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> Eventually, the campaign plan presentations. Jane Belden Knowles is running because she recognizes that there's a drought in representation in Iowa, and droughts don't do well for farms. We're investing most of our money, over 60%, on field and paid communications. And because we live our values, we're paying in turns $15 an hour. Since we have rural communities with houses far apart, um, they're gonna be going on horses um, to those doors, knocking on those doors, and that's also a really great digital tactic. <laughs> Because I was like, where are they playing for all of this TV that they're doing? Because I, I just know, when saw... when they said field was 60%, right. I would a heart attack. <laughs> it's like, okay. The horse... Uh, that was a lot. But you know what? It. They thought through it. Like, yeah. they, like, had the backup for it and really went for it. My favorite would be to see the line item on that budget. Yeah, like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> and the winner of the Charleston, South Carolina Arena Cup Team 14! Savannah's team didn't win the Arena Cup, but they did get a participation medal. <laughs>